All right, so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. We're going to just go through chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 9 now. And um, again, we'll go through this just slow as we can, um, enough, enough to be able to, to walk through it carefully. One of the follow-ups I had from last week, you start to, re- um, one of the follow-ups I had last week was, what is the population of Corinth? Um, and while estimates vary, population uh, broke down in three ways. Um, um, ap- approximately one-third were slaves, one-third were emancipated slaves, and one-third freeborn citizens. So when people counted uh, how many people lived in Corinth, um, what they usually did was count just the freeborn citizens. So it was usually undercounting by a third. And they say that it was roughly 40,000 or so f- uh, freeborn citizens, which means there were roughly then 120,000 males. But it gives you an idea that there were more than just males that were there. And so the best estimates are fr- usually around between 200,000 and as high as 400,000. Now, by way of comparison, Ephesus, which was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, um, was 250,000 people. So I think the lower estimate's probably about correct. So about 200,000 people. But that's a lot of people to be in this small little area. Um, if you go there and visit there, you know, maybe a tenth of it has been uncovered, uh, not a whole lot. Um, and it just seems like a dinky little place. But, uh, you know, to have 200,000 people there is, is, a, is a big deal. So anyway, that's one of the follow-ups I had from, from last week. So about 200,000 people. Uh, that's my answer, and I'm sticking with it. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God which is in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from, our, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, just as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you're not lacking in any gift as you eagerly await the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So as we begin to walk through this, what I'm going to do is just, um, I'm going to just casually comment on the things that kind of occur to me. Um, Again, this is the time to ask questions, uh, raise criticisms. Um, If any existential crisis, things that are causing you to say, who am I and why am I here? Um, And you may still wonder that anyway. Um, But we'll walk through this together. But you know, we begin to look at Paul called as an apostle. The idea of, of being called here, in some sense, originally referred to almost like being called to a meal. Um, but here, what Paul refers to it is called, called into God's kingdom, called to be a, a leader there. And so they, not only are they called to be there, but they're also called then saints uh, as you begin to look at it. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. In some respect, the fact that Paul was called, and we read about that in Acts chapter 9, the fact that Paul was called put within him a profound sense of obligation. For Paul to have been called despite his murderous intent towards the church is really is an act of mercy and grace, isn't it? We would expect normally people who are murderers to be put to death in a society, like ours or even like his. But he wasn't put to death, he was put to work. And he was put to work proclaiming the gospel throughout all the kingdom, all, throughout all the empire. Um, this idea of obligation follows Paul throughout the rest of his life, leaving him with this deep sense of, I must do this because I've been called to do this by God himself. So he's called to do it, and he has this obligation, and he's called not just to be Paul, but he's called to be Paul the Apostle. Um, An apostle is not an office to be sought, but rather Paul is a sent one from God, a chosen one, a messenger, um, chosen by the will of God, by or through the means of God. As we see in Paul, this not only this sense of obligation, but we see also this sense of gratitude towards God for actually calling him. So he's not obligated in the sense of he's doing it out of duty necessarily. There is some aspect of that. But there's a calling in the sense of gratitude of, if God did this for me, what can he do for you? And so we get that. Paul carries that idea with him through it. He's a messenger of the manifold grace of God. 
this dual aspect of gratitude and obligation, drive Paul to as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. This would kind of characterize Paul's life and his character, particularly in the, in the book of Corinth, even though he writes it in Romans, he writes Romans from Corinth, oddly enough, but he writes this about the Corinthians that what they're doing is in their disruption, their misuse of gifts, their, their worship, which is not going correctly, they're bringing chaos into the church. And in the chaos, they're not worshiping correctly anymore. They're worshiping themselves more than they are the creator. So yeah, his goal of as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. And it'll drive his discussion when we get to marriage, divorce, and remarriage in, in chapter 7. It drives him to see the churches he, he has started. He, it drives him to be pastoral about those churches. He's not just interested in saying, you know, I've got a little check mark on my belt and saying, I started the church in Corinth. I started the, I was never Colossae, but they're my disciples. And I was started the church in Ephesus. I was there. He's not keeping the list and saying, here's what I did. But he's driving them, he's driven to go back and visit them because he's being pastoral, because he cares about them. And when he hears about a church he's helped start, and he spent 18 months there, and that they are writing to him saying, hey, we've got some issues we need your help on, Paul's jumping through hoops to try to get there and to help, help them solve their problems. It drives him to see the churches he started and to be pastoral with them. It, it drives them also to defend his office. So Paul's in some sense not name dropping and saying, by the way, I'm an apostle. But this aspect of him being an apostle would drive what's going to be in part of Corinthians. It's going to drive most of what's in 2 Corinthians and what's there. And because there was this, this aspect of, uh, and we looked at this when we went through 2 Corinthians. I, why we did 2 Corinthians first, I have no idea. I don't know what was going through my mind at the time. It was, we went through it, I think, two years ago. Um, but this aspect of why is Paul an apostle was causing great consternation in the, in the church. And I think it's, it's, in, it's beginning here in 1 Corinthians and it comes to full flavor in, as why Paul wrote the painful letter um, that goes on between uh, 2 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Um, again, he, he's driven to defend the office, not for his sake, but for the sake of the one who sent him. Imagine, if you will, that you're an ambassador of the United States to another nearly hostile nation. When you get there, the inhabitants recognize that you're sent, but they choose to slander you and to physically abuse you. They call you a liar, saying that your messages are from, from your sending government. They call you a liar, saying that your messages from your sending government are nothing but lies. It reflects poorly upon the receiving nation. Well, the metaphor changes a little bit with Paul, but it starts out like that, where they, they in Corinth and other places, they, they take Paul's apostleship to task, which really has a reflection upon God, who's the sender of Paul. Paul's not coming under his own authority. He didn't seek the office. He didn't seek the mission, but he's doing it because he is obligated and grateful for what God's done in his life. Um, he's there uh, not just from another government. He's the representative of the living God. And what Paul endures and what is reflected in both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is the ill treatment um, of Paul. Remember, this isn't Paul's uh, introduction to Corinth. He's already vis visited physically at least once. He spent 18 months living and teaching them. Uh, Paul's use of the word apostle is not a not so... Paul's use of the word apostle is a not so subtle reminder that what's at stake here, as we'll find out in the rest of the book, Paul is sent from God, uh, which has been God's plan all along. I, I realize I'm not... So we've talked about Paul being called. We've talked about Paul, the apostle. Uh, and we talked about Paul as being part of God's will. Again, he says here, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It is God's plan. When God's will occurs, God makes a plan to execute that will. So God, God is sovereign and able to make a plan. His ability to orchestrate all the events, all creation, all of men's will, other, other men's will, is part of his providence. He executes his providence according to his sovereign will and his sovereign choice. And he has chosen Paul and given Paul the ability, the uh, ability by the Spirit, to be able to do what he's called him to do, to take the, na to take the gospel to the nations. So uh, again, the will is someone's pers a, a person's desire, uh, a person's desired purpose or outcome, and it's God's purpose or desired outcome that the church be established, but that the church be established uh, 
in the name of God, for the glory of God, by the purpose of God. And the Corinthians are deviating from that somehow. They're, they're deviating that because they're doing church their own way. They're doing church in their, um, their, in their idea of what church should be. And so Paul's calling them back as we get through the, the entire book. So this is the beginning. Paul called an apostle by the will of God. But we also run, a guy, run across a guy named Sosthenes. Anybody remember Sosthenes from last week? Dave? Yeah, it seems so. Um, and so where is he now? He's with Paul. And Paul is in, you know, writing this from Ephesus. So Sosthenes, I guess you could view that as an early retirement plan. <laughs> Leave Corinth and go to Ephesus. Um, you know, he's, he's with uh, Paul in Ephesus. And if it's the same, if Sosthenes is not one of those real, I mean, it's not like Mark. Um, there was, at one time, there were seven Marks here at church. Um, anyway, the senior go there. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, I got the gray hair for a reason, yeah. which means I'll probably repeat it next week too, and forget that I repeated it. So, um, no, Sosthenes. You know, there aren't too many people named Sosthenes, and it's, it's likely that this is the same Sosthenes we saw in Acts chapter eighteen. You know, getting the daylight speed out of him there. Um, why he got the daylight speed out, we don't know. But what we do know is he's mentioned here as being. What is he called here? Our brother Sosthenes. And it's actually not our brother, it's actually the brother. There's a, a, a definite article in the Greek here. He's not just some guy, he's the guy that's accompanying Paul where Paul is in Ephesus. So um, it indicates that he was well known to the Corinthians. Sosthenes, the brother whom you know, indicates that he was a co worker of Paul's. So he's gone from being the guy getting beat up, living that living in infamy to the guy who's, who's a co-laborer with Paul in the work of the ministry among the Ephesians. All right, so that's the end of uh, verse 1. We get to verse 2. We talk about the church of God. The Greek word for church is used 22 times in 1 Corinthians. And if you've been around churches for any length of time, you know that the Greek word ecclesia or ecclesia, depending on your, who you were taught by, means assembly or called out once. The question, of course, is called out by whom and to what? You know, first the church gathered to uh, God. Um, uh, the first the church gathered to God from the world, and you might have many congregations or gatherings, even as we saw in Ephesus, where there's a congregation, for instance, of silversmiths. So the the word called out or congregation doesn't mean called out to be a religious institution by definition. It just means a group of people who have a like concern. Um, you could say a church is a congregation, certainly, but the group of silversmiths in Acts chapter 19 who were complaining, you know, they're essentially the economic union in, in uh, Ephesus at the time, um, saying, you know, these guys are spreading rumors and they're cutting down on our ability to sell sil silver trinkets and, and, uh, and so on. And, you know, they're harming the economy. And so these, the silversmith congregation, if you will, rose up and took and beat the daylights out of uh, Gaius and Aristarchus and yelled at them for two hours uh, in the Ephesian theater. Um, so you might have congregations like that. Um, you might, the, the congregation usually has a singular purpose. Um, and, and again, this, they're in the, the silversmith congregation, so to speak, was bettering the silversmith trade. And so the assembly or called out gathering that we call the church today has a singular focus. We are gathered to God to worship and to obey. Now, we can make all sorts of other things that are become important to think about what churches do and how they do it, but if we, if we take our eyes off of that prize, we take our eyes off of that focus, we've missed what the church is actually doing. Right? The church is to proclaim the gospel to the glory of God and to worship Him. The second of all, the church is a singular church. Um, the church was made up of several house churches, but behind the writings, the letter to the church singular was an act appealing to the unity of the church. Paul doesn't write to, he doesn't write to the churches or the house churches in Corinth. He writes to the church in Corinth, which happens to be made up of, individ, of individual little house churches. He's trying to get them to realize that in, in the way that they're denigrating the apostleship, in the way that they're ignoring what Scripture has to say, in the way that they're operating out of the flesh, not out of love, that they're not one church anymore. And Paul's calling them back to that concept. 
And so when he says to the church in Corinth, um, he's, he's really making mention of the fact that there are, they've gotten off topic. So he's calling them back, and that's what the whole, the whole rest of the book is going to be about. Um, you, 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 should, you should notice, because we've obviously seen, we're looking for repeated phrases, that the person of Christ, whether the name is Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, or just Christ, how many times is it mentioned in the first eight verses? You didn't know there was going to be a pop quiz, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll take a sip of coffee, you guys count. Eight. Jesus Christ is mentioned eight times. Who do you think is the focus of the book? Jesus. If we're thinking, you know, again, how, ironically, I'm going to ask you, how many times do you think we've talked about repetition? Repetition is how God gets your attention. I, I've, mentioned, you know, I've mentioned it before. There's no such thing as bold or underline or italics or a different font sizes or bigger or smaller. God gets your attention in the Word of God by repetition. And so when he repeats something eight times in nine verses, stick up your hand and say, I think I got it. Right? It's about Jesus. And that's the part, of the part of the problem, is they were no longer focusing upon Jesus, they were focusing on themselves. It's easy for us to get off topic when we get embroiled in our uh, little circumstances or little troubles. And what Paul's trying to do here is saying, let's get focused back upon the church of God in Corinth that's in Christ. And it's the singular church, the church unified, the church universal, if you will, in the Corinthian area. We all should be marching to the same, um, uh, same drummer, if you will. There are obvious problems. There are even multiple locations. But Paul is calling the multi-gifted, multi-location church to remember that they share their identity, their purpose, their calling in Christ. It is Christ that must be the unifying factor. And this is mentioned in chapter 3, chapter 10, chapter 12. Um, it's the purpose of gifts in chapter 12 through chapter 14. It's the purpose of thinking about how do we worship together in chapter 11. All of those things, we're getting our focus off of Christ. Let's bring that back together. And those are always good reminders for any church, right, at any age. You don't want to go until you've got problems to say, you know, we should get back to the beginning. Rather, we should be reminding ourselves that all the time. And then thirdly, the, the Greek word ecclesia was already in use to describe the people of God through the Greek translation called the Septuagint. In other words, what I'm trying to do is, is give you the idea of this idea of church that's in Corinth. Um, the Corinthians walked into this phrase. They didn't invent the phrase, but the church started to be using, especially here, um, and God had been orchestrating that all along between the idea of what a congregation does in Ephesus or what, the, what was called the congregation of God's people in the Septuagint. Um, it was all part of God's plan. Um, the, idea, you know, was, was, the idea was to create a word that could describe this group of people. What, is, what do they do? They're gathered to God from the world in order to worship and to obey. The church, the one for whom Christ died, the one who left heaven to seek her, is really all part of God's significant plan. Um, so again, if we want to describe the church of God, we see, first of all, it's in Corinth. It was God's plan to begin this church. This is why Paul was sent here. Uh, we would be the poorer without understanding the nature and the use of gifts, or how to resolve disputes, or what a biblical view of repentance is if we didn't have the church of Corinth. If they didn't have problems, we wouldn't know how to resolve them. Their misfortune is for our benefit. Two times it's mentioned in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 10. These things were written for your instruction. They were written so that you might know these people disobeyed. And what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians is pointing back to Egypt saying, and I'll, I'll go through it again because I'm old and gray, the... 1 Corinthians is saying, you go back to Egypt, and these things were written because they failed. They disobeyed. They died coming out of Egypt. This was recorded so that you might know what it means to disobey. Paul is reminding us here, even as we get started in Corinth, that it's the church of God in Corinth, and it's going to be repeated often enough. And it was, their problems are written for our instruction, so that we might know what to do when they come about. Yeah, we're, we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Um, we've been sanctified in the past. We've viewed this before, but what, this is 
what is called in the Ordo Salutis or the Order of Salvation, the act of the Holy Spirit regenerating and then sealing us is an act of sanctification. He is taking you when you believe and setting you apart from the world to himself. That's a special place to be. That aspect of sanctification is God setting you apart from the world. The act of converting, justifying, and adopting us is a sanctifying act of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. All the members of the Trinity are spoken of as being engaged in and executing the plan into which we were called. So when we say that we're, we're sanctified, there is a sanctification which happened in the past. But there's also a sanctification which is present. The work of sanctifying us does not stop at salvation. Yes? God continues on to work through us. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Present sanctification is the present I'm sorry, progressive, incomplete, and lifelong maturing process in which a Christian gradually becomes holy. This is from a quote from David Nacelli, or Andy Nacelli. I mean, present sanctification is the progressive, incomplete, and lifelong maturing process in which a Christian gradually becomes more holy. Now, does that mean it's a straight line from here to here? <laughs> oh, that it would would be right. No, it's not a straight line. There are many hills and valleys in our, progressive, in our progressive sanctification. But it is that it is progressive as God continues to work through us. And it's this God's, if you think about it, God's present act or his past act was to send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And that act, when we believe, sets us apart. It sanctifies us. But he doesn't leave us alone there. What's his act? What's his... Uh, What's his work now to sanctify us? He intercedes for us and he advocates for us. That's his present ministry on the throne because it's a continual act of sanctifying you. God's continuing to work for you and through you. So we're sanctifying from the past, sanctifying in the present, sanctifying in the future. There is a future sanctification as part of the new heaven and new earth where we're freed from the penalty, the presence, and the power of sin on the earth. So this aspect of sanctification is not a throwaway, cause, a throwaway phrase. It's actually him telling us who we are. We are sanctified because we're set apart, past, present, and future. And it's Jesus' present ministry on the throne now to do that for us. It's also the Spirit's present ministry. The Son has been sent from the Father, and the Spirit's been sent from the Father in order to sanctify us, to separate us, to encourage us, to strengthen us. But in that sanctifying act, which is an aspect of setting apart, we're called saints. Um, called saints. Um, the holy ones is what it literally means. Not holy of themselves, as if it's something internal which works itself out, but it's, a, it, and it's not a works-based holiness, but it's a group of people set apart for God's plan to multiply, fill, rule, and subdue the earth with disciples, not just children. We looked at this a little bit in our uh, foundations class yesterday at the, the biblical counseling training. Um, if you look at, and we don't have time to look in there, but Genesis 1, 26, 27, we're given a, what's called the cultural mandate to fill, multiply, fill, multiply, rule, and subdue the earth. That's the command given to Adam and Eve. And if you look at, at uh, Roman, or, um, Matthew chapter 28, starting at like verse 18, the disciples are given essentially a cultural mandate for the church. To, to make disciples, multiply and fill. And what are we supposed to do? Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you so that there's order in the church, so that there's order in what you do. We're ruling and subduing. Now, that doesn't mean I, I don't want to go into the Christian, Christian nationalism debate uh, today. Um, I probably don't want to go into it ever, but we'll see if that happens or not. But we're given a mandate to work with the people we have around us to bring them into Christ, to make disciples. And then we do that, we're helping them, we're helping rule and subdue, so to speak, in the sense of teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. Well, I don't have a picture of it. It's unfortunate because I have a picture. I don't have a picture of it to show you. Let me rephrase that. I haven't shown you a picture. <laughs> I have the picture. But in, when we were in Istanbul in, uh, in 2005, the oldest, one of the oldest churches uh, in the world, literally, and at the time that it was built, it was actually the largest dome church in the world, uh, bigger than um, the church in Rome, Basilica in Rome at the time. It's called Hagia Sophia. Um, Hagios, meaning holy, Sophia, meaning wisdom. 
and it's it's now been turned into a it was turned into a, a mosque and it was turned into a museum and now it's being turned back into a mosque but it's a it's a beautiful building i mean these um these vast alabaster um and i'm not kidding it's it's got to be um 15 feet around in circumference um it's just this enormous thing that's been carved out and that's just one and i think there's six of them that are in there it's a beautiful place to visit and and lots of history they've left the the christian symbols of the uh, the fish that are up on the the wall if you go in there so um the idea that are, are there that hagia sophia is a reminder that god has set his part his people apart and that the the fact that the building still exists 1600 years later uh, is just an amazing thing and and to have it sit there as a reminder god has set his people apart is, is a good thing so I'll have that, I'll note to myself, um, I'll have that picture for you next week. All right, so where have we left off? To the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who've been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all in every place who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and ours. He calls them with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we've been called with grace and peace. Here's the idea that We've been given things that, that few others in the entire world have had. Angels look down upon the things we've been given and are somewhat jealous. If there, can be a, if there can be a righteous jealousy, the angels look down upon what we've been given and wonder what's going on. We've been given grace by give, being, having Christ having died for us, by Christ giving us life, by Christ having a mission for us. We've been given peace because his spirit resides within us. And Paul wishes for that. Now, it's a little bit ironic in that Paul's addressing non-peaceful letters that have come to Paul from before. But he wants for there to be peace in the church, and so that's the beginning of his prayer for the church. So let's, let's uh, continue on and we get to verses 4. Now, verses 4 to 8, as we continue on, are, is one long sentence. He says, I give thanks to my God. Giving thanks is the main verb which drives this whole sentence. Uh, it's not like Paul didn't have anything to do with the Corinthians receiving God's grace to begin with. He was the apostle who brought the, the gospel at which they believed. But the ultimate praise is God's alone. Notice also that Paul isn't giving thanks because uh, matters are going exceptionally well. This church which I've started, which is a testament to how much I've been a good apostle, he's saying, my prayer for you I thank my God always concerning you for the grace which God has given you in Christ Jesus. The grace of their recipient of God's gospel. Even in the midst of strife of the church, Paul is giving thanks. Why would we give thanks for people not getting along? Why would we give thanks for people not loving one another? Why would we give thanks for people um, not looking forward to the resurrection? Because it gives Paul a chance, in some sense, to explain all these things yet one more time, for, writing for us. He says, concerning you, um, always, I give thanks to my God, always concerning you, uh, because of the grace of God given to you in Christ. Here Paul is using the word grace for their gifts. They've been given the gospel, which is one aspect of grace, but here Paul begins to use the word grace in a slightly different form, where he's talking about the gifts that they all receive. We all know that the church in Corinth was known for its many gifts. We're going to see gifts of prophecy, gifts of tongues, of interpretation, um, and, and those are the spectacular gifts. But there are also gifts of service that happen along. Again, Paul will devote three chapters, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, to the discussion about gifts. So he's, but what he's doing is thanking God that they all have gifts, and they're all exercising those gifts. Now, they're not exercising them in a way that glorifies God sometimes. But they, are, they do have them. They're just being misused. And so he has a, a reason to write and help them. We continue on with verse 5. It says that in everything you are enriched in him in all speech and knowledge. By, by saying speech, he's talking about the oral expression. Something that you conceive of your mind and you have the ability to explain it so other people can understand it. You, you have the ability to persuade someone else. This is used in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. It says, Moses was educated in all wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was proficient in speaking and action. Now, when I read that, again, new this week, I went, what? Because how many of you would say that the, Moses was proficient in speech? Would Moses have described himself that way? 
That's what I thought too. <laughs> I'm glad you agree with me. So it caught me by surprise when it says that Moses was, uh, Moses was proficient in speaking and action. So despite what we think about Moses, about what he said about himself, he was proficient. He was trained by the Egyptians um, at the highest levels. No one walked away from Moses thinking he's dumber than a box of hammers. Right? What's that? We can talk later. No, there... Moses was able to communicate. He just didn't have much confidence, it seems like. He, he looked at his foibles and said, these, are, these define me, which is instructive to us, just as a comment. You know, the things that we have wrong with us don't always define us. That's not our identity. We're not, our identity is not I'm a stutterer. Their identity is I'm a person called by God to a mission who might stutter. We don't need to take our problems and say this, identif this identity issue defines us. And we'll talk about that, of course, later on. So there was given speech, which again is the oral expression, thought about in the mind, but able to persuade some other people about what I think. We also have knowledge here, which is a comprehension or intellectual grasp of something. This knowledge, particularly about God himself, where God reveals himself and makes himself known. Again, read Psalm 17 sometime where the first six verses are all about how God can be seen and known through creation or at least understood that there's some designer out there. But once you get past verse 6 and verse 7 through the verse 11 or so, you begin to see how God has specifically revealed himself to you. That's the knowledge he's talking about here. It's a gift of grace. That he's, it's the knowledge that's a gift of grace, not a, great, a gift or not a knowledge that's naturally known. And what do we also know about the, the church in Corinth in verse 6? Just as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. You have gifts, and everybody knows it. Everybody has said already, we've got great gifts here. But as Chloe and others were writing back to Paul saying, we've got issues, we've got problems, this gives Paul the opportunity to correct them. This is the important part about Paul bringing attention to these things. These gifts are evident. In other letters, Paul gives thanks for faith, hope, and love. And Paul is not saying that they're missing, but rather that speech and knowledge, and knowledge predominantly are there and are being used, and sometimes misused. Again, they're evident, but their misuse is likewise evidence, evident. God's grace in people's lives are confirmed in the gifts that they've been given. If I've been given the gift of teaching, then other people recognize that gift and say, Mark's a teacher, or Mark's dumber than a box of hammers, or a box of rocks, or whatever you want to choose. All right, so verse 7 says, so that you might not lack in any gift as you eagerly await the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've completely blown my slides here. Uh, grace gifts. Made me some, there we go. <laughs> I'll pause here for a second. All right. Now, I can continue on while we, we go. So we'll... Um, so you, what Paul says, you know, your gifts have been confirmed and what other people see. Um, but what you should know that you're, from my perspective, you're not lacking in any gift, as he says in verse 7. You're not lacking in any gift as you eagerly await the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the reasons we touch on eschatology as it comes up in Scripture is because that is our hope for the future. We don't do it just so that we, we kind of mollify ourselves. And, well, you can settle down, Mark. You can be nice. It's okay. We don't settle ourselves down with the knowledge of eschatology. We motivate. We're motivated by eschatology because we know that Christ is coming back and that when Christ comes back, he will be for us. Christ is the one who confirms us. The same word that used back in verse 6 when he says, um, just as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, he says again in verse, um, where to go? Verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end. Um, Christ is the one who confirms us. Um, God will confirm his choice by sustaining us to the end. What God begins, he completes. God sustains to the end when the culmination of the plan of redemption uh, that began in Genesis 3 is completed in the new heavens and the new earth at the end of Revelation. When he comes to judge the world, raise the dead, and make all things new. 
no, he, he confirms you not only to the end, but also leaves us guiltless. For the believers, this is a day. Of, this coming day is a day of rejoicing, a day of deliverance, a day of redemption, not a day of judgment. And finally, this confirmation is in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The confirmation isn't in my abilities. It's not in myself, my ability to stir up my feelings or my emotions saying, I'm going to sustain myself to the end. The sustenance, the perseverance comes from Jesus Christ by providing the day number one and his spirit number two. And that God is faithful to that. God is faithful while we wait. By whom we were called into the fellowship of his son, God is faithful. And God is the one who will bring it to pass. So verse 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We come full circle from the introduction in verses 1 and 2. God's faithfulness is having called and redeemed them now, which serves as the ground of Paul's hope for the future, for the, the hope of their final salvation at the end. God is the one who's faithful. You know, and the troubles and trials we go through each and every day, they're meant, to incur, they're meant to be part of our sanctifying process. They're not God's whimsical, let's see how they deal with this, but let's see if they're committed to me. And that's so that he would know, because he knows, it's so that we know who we are and where we're from. God is the one who's faithful. And for that day he's preparing us for, he'll be faithful to bring it about. So, three quick things as we kind of draw things to, I'll go to the next page here, which is an eye chart. All right. um, I'm just going to leave that there because um, I don't think I have an application page. So, three, th quick, three quick things on application. God's will and plan. Our salvation is based upon God's calling. Yes and amen, right? And what you see in this beginning passage is God's plan, his salvation, is on display through the Corinthians. Misusing gifts, though they might be, God has called them to have gifts, to display gifts, to use gifts, and even it's been part of God's plan to write this letter so we might know what to do as well. God has planned all of this out, again, for our good and his glory. We, we need to trust in God's plan. That's not always easy. But God will make a way. The second thing is, God's gifts and redemption are not dependent upon our will. Um, uh, Gordon Fee, in his commentary, says, What's remarkable is that Paul should express such confidence about a community whose current behavior is anything but blameless, and whom on several occasions he must exhort with the strongest kinds of warning. We've, when we went through 2 Corinthians, we noticed that there's a letter between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians called the painful letter. No one likes those, neither getting them nor receiving them, but they're part of God's plan. And following through, and the, the Corinthian church repenting wasn't really all bound up in Paul. It was through the Spirit which reminded them through Paul's words that they had, they had erred, that they were offensive, they were offending and so on. But the Corinthian church is full of problems, but one day these problems fade. And in that day, God gets the glory, the attention, and the praise because of our deliverance in Him. Even in the midst of problems, we see that we're not sufficient for those problems. God alone is. God is the one we depend on to carry us through through those problems. And the third thing, you see this in the whole tenor of this introduction, there is thanksgiving to God. Even in the midst of a church having problems, the fact that they are called by God, they're ministering in the area, they're exercising gifts, Paul says there's reason for thanksgiving. It might not be perfect, but this is where we are as part of God's plan. God is the subject of all the actions that are in this beginning passage. Whether it's mentioning Jesus Christ and the attention to which he should be the unifying factor, or it's the work of the Spirit in granting the gifts, or it's the Father's plan. The entire Trinity is involved in this first eight, nine verses. It's a marvelous thing to see that God himself has a plan, and we're part of that plan, even if we have problems. But we give thanks to God for whatever he has planned, because we know it's for our good and for his glory. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Father, again, thank you for your word and the comfort it is to know that what we go through
si comes through the, the, the sifting of your fingers even before it comes to us. Your desire is to see us grow in sanctification, for us to grow in knowledge and speech so that we might persuade others to come to Christ. We might persuade others to believe in the gospel and depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, you grant us all these things. You have given us gifts as well. Even as we march through Corinthians, help us to determine whether we have love or not for one another, whether we're exercising gifts out of personal um, uh, strength or whether you, we're doing this by the strength of the Spirit. All of these things, Father, you've written this letter for us to be able to know not only are we, that we're in Christ and that we're beloved by you, but that we are part of your plan. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.